Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories, where we play tales to take you away from today. On this episode, we are jam-packed with stories. In fact, when I finished putting it together, I was worried that it might be just too much. We have some amazing stories. Michael tells us all about the Moonville Tunnel, Jim strands us atop the Hemis Mountains, and Gary lends his talents to a new edition of... Johnny, is this true? Add to it a science fiction story that explores the loneliness of space. Now, how about we begin our travels with this five-minute mystery? Another five-minute mystery. This five-minute mystery is being brought to you by anyone who is a certified maniac. As we're about to hear, there are pretenders, and there are those who obviously don't know the definition. Now, try to enjoy this story, but I will understand your frustration if you are, in fact, a maniac. Samson the Detective Extraordinary. This is Oliver Edgerton. When a jewel collector calls a private detective, it only means one thing. Am I right? If you're referring to robbery, yes, but it's more than that. Can you come over? I'll make it a large fee. Open your door, client. I'll be there to greet you. I don't see the need of calling in a private detective, Mr. Edgerton. After all, I'm the investigator for the insurance company. That's the whole trouble, Maxwell. You've accused me of stealing my own diamond. Take it nice and slow, Mr. Edgerton. What's the rap? Last night, Mr. Sloan, my safe was broken into and one of my prized diamonds was taken. Anything else touched? That's the strange thing. Only this one diamond was stolen. You must be dealing with a maniac. Maxwell here is the investigator for the insurance company. He claims he has proof that I stole my own diamond so I could collect the insurance. Well, I have. It's the most preposterous charge I've ever heard. Your company, Maxwell, is just trying to get out of paying me the insurance. What's the proof you claim to have, Maxwell? This morning, after Mr. Edgerton phoned my company to report the robbery... I was sent out to investigate. Never mind the embroidery. What are the facts? I went into the garden and found footprints clearly outlined in the mud. You recall it rained last night. Yeah, I remember. Go ahead. I took plaster casts of the print. Here they are. Very pretty. What's the next exhibit? See here, Sloan. Are you going to permit him to go on with this nonsense? I'm democratic. He's got a right to talk. While Mr. Edgerton was away this afternoon, I went to his bedroom and found this pair of shoes. You can see to yourself that they have mud all over the sole. Watch out, the mud's falling off. My biggest proof is this. The plaster cast I made in the garden this morning fit these shoes exactly. The prints in the garden lead directly to the library, where the safe is located. Those shoes were not in my closet this morning. I looked for them then. There's your proof, Sloan. Edgerton stole a diamond so he could collect the insurance on it. What did you do before you became an investigator for this insurance company, Maxwell? Huh? What's the idea of that question? Just wondering, that's all. Say, did you know it rained this afternoon? The prince in the garden must be gone. Yes, I know it rained. Will you stop discussing the weather, Mr. Sloan, and tell this man he's crazy? He's not crazy, Mr. Edgerton. He knows what he's doing. You didn't steal that diamond, and he knows it. What clue did Sam Sloan discover that proved Edgerton's innocence? In just a moment, we'll know, but first... Must be dealing with a maniac, huh? For the record, a maniac is a person exhibiting extreme symptoms of wild behavior. Now, I don't know what you just heard, but I didn't hear any symptoms of madness. What I did hear was a completely implausible story with symptoms of complete silliness. Shall we go see if I'm right? And now, back to our story. You're talking through your hat, Sloan. Edgerton stole his own diamond. You manufactured your own pony proof, Maxwell. Edgerton's shoes can't possibly be the ones that made those prints in the plastic hat. You see, any good investigator knows that anyone walking in mud makes a bigger impression than that of his shoes. The fact that the shoes and prints match proves that Edgerton never walked in that garden. You got hold of his shoes, made plastic casts, and then put some mud on them to make it look real. You didn't want to pay the insurance, Maxwell, but you'll have to pay a lot more. A comfortable, long jail sentence. (laughs) 
tell our private detective was rather flippant in his description of the crime, but he was correct about one thing. The foot impression would be enlarged. However, it would also be reversed when collected and thereby restoring the perspective. I'm just saying. This mystery was brought to you by Maniacs Everywhere. Is that you say? I received this email from Kenny in Austin, Texas. One of my favorite cities, by the way. Kenny writes, About the FMMs, 5-Minute Mysteries, why is the quality so bad on some of them and better on others? I would have thought that they all would have been recordings. Just curious, Kenny. Hey Kenny, thanks for your question. It's easy to explain. Back in the 40s when the FMMs were made, they used a system of transcription to record them. Basically, these are large discs similar to the modern day phono record. If the disc was taken care of, the quality of the recording is going to be good. If the disc had numerous scratches or hung on someone's wall, say, 50 years, the recording is going to be anything from horrible to okay. People collect these discs and hang them on their walls for decoration. I personally would love to have one myself. By the way, I do use filtering on the 5-Minute Mysteries to restore them from time to time. I use high and low-pass filters and noise reduction to accomplish this. In fact, on today's story, I used both. And now, here are your stories by you and for you. Our marquee story for this week is so good. I'm not going to spoil it by saying much about it other than it's titled The Nothing Equation. It was written by Tom Goodwin and is read for you by Mark Nelson. The Nothing Equation by Tom Godwin The cruiser vanished back into hyperspace and he was alone in the observation bubble. 10,000 light-years beyond the galaxy's outermost sun. He looked out the windows at the gigantic sea of emptiness around him, and wondered again what the danger had been that had so terrified the men before him. Of one thing he was already certain. He would find that nothing was waiting outside the bubble to kill him. The first bubble attendant had committed suicide, and the second was a mindless maniac on the earthbound cruiser but it must have been something inside the bubble that had caused it, or else they had imagined it all. He went across the small room, his magnetized soles loud on the thin metal floor in the bubble's silence. He sat down in the single chair, his weight very slight in the feeble artificial gravity, and reviewed the known facts. The bubble was a project of the Earth's Galactic Observation Bureau, positioned there to gather data from observations that could not be made from within the galaxy. Since metallic mass affected the hypersensitive instruments, the bubble had been made as small and light as possible. It was for that reason that it could accommodate only one attendant. The Bureau had selected Horn as the bubble's first attendant, and the cruiser left him there for his six months period of duty. When it made its scheduled return with his replacement, he was found dead from a tremendous overdose of sleeping pills. On the table was his daily report log and his last entry, made three months before. "'I haven't attended to the instruments for a long time, because it hates us, and it doesn't want us here. It hates me the most of all, and keeps trying to get into the bubble to kill me.' I can hear it whenever I stop and listen, and I know it won't be long. I'm afraid of it, and I want to be asleep when it comes, but I'll have to make it soon, because I have only twenty sleeping pills left, and if— The sentence was never finished. According to the temperature recording instruments in the bubble, his body ceased radiating heat that same night. 
The bubble was cleaned, fumigated, and inspected inside and out. No sign of any inimical entity or force could be found. Silverman was Horn's replacement. When the cruiser returned six months later bringing him, Green, to be Silverman's replacement, Silverman was completely insane. He babbled about something that had been waiting outside the bubble to kill him, but his nearest to a rational statement was to say once, when asked for the hundredth time what he had seen, "'Nothing. You can't really see it. But you feel it, watching you, and you hear it, trying to get in to kill you. One time I bumped the wall and, for God's sake, take me away from it, take me back to earth!' Then he had tried to hide under the captain's desk, and the ship's doctor had led him away. The bubble was minutely examined again, and the cruiser employed every detector device it possessed to search surrounding space for light-years in all directions. Nothing was found. When it was time for the new replacement to be transferred to the bubble, he reported to Captain McDowell. "'Everything is ready, Green,' McDowell said. You are the next one. His shaggy gray eyebrows met in a scowl. It would be better if they would let me select the replacement instead of them. He flushed with a touch of resentment and said, The Bureau found my intelligence and initiative of thought satisfactory. I know the characteristics you don't need. What they ought to have is somebody like one of my engine room roustabouts, too ignorant to get scared, and too dumb to go nuts. Then we could get a sane report six months from now, instead of the ravings of a maniac. I suggest, he said stiffly, that you reserve judgment until that time comes, sir. And that was all he knew about the danger, real or imaginary, that had driven two men into insanity. He would have six months in which to find the answer. Six months minus, he looked at the chronometer and saw that twenty minutes had passed since he left the cruiser. Somehow it seemed much longer. He moved to light a cigarette, and his metal sole scraped the floor with the same startling loudness he had noticed before. The bubble was as silent as a tomb. It was not much larger than a tomb, a sphere eighteen feet in diameter, made of thin sheet metal and criss-crossed outside with narrow reinforcing girders to keep the internal air pressure from rupturing it. The floor under him was six feet up from the sphere's bottom, and the space beneath held the air regenerator and waste converter units, the storage batteries and the food cabinets. The compartment in which he sat contained chair, table, a narrow cot, banks of dials, a remote control panel for operating the instruments mounted outside the hull, a microfilm projector, and a pair of exerciser springs attached to one wall. That was all. There was no means of communication, since a hyperspace communicator would have affected the delicate instruments with its radiations. But there was a small microfilm library to go with the projector, so that he should be able to pass away the time pleasantly enough. But it was not the fear of boredom that was behind the apprehension he could already feel touching at his mind. It had not been boredom that had turned Horn into a suicide, and Silverman into... Something cracked sharply behind him, like a gunshot in the stillness, and he leaped to his feet, whirling to face it. It was only a metal reel of data tape that had dropped out of the spectrum analyzer into the storage tray. His heart was thumping fast, and his attempt to laugh at his nervousness sounded hollow and mirthless. Something inside or outside the bubble had driven two men insane with its threat, and now that he was irrevocably exiled in the bubble himself, he could no longer dismiss their fear as products of their imagination. Both of them had been rational, intelligent men, as carefully selected by the Observation Bureau as he had been. He set in to search the bubble, overlooking nothing. When he crawled down into the lower compartment, he hesitated, then opened the longest blade of his knife before searching among the dark recesses down there. He found nothing, not even a speck of dust. Back in his chair again, he began to doubt his first conviction. Perhaps, 
there really had been some kind of an invisible force or entity outside the bubble. Both Horn and Silverman had said that it had tried to get in to kill them. They had been very definite about that part. There were six windows around the bubble's walls, set there to enable the attendant to see all the outside mounted instruments and dials. He went to them to look out, one by one, and from all of them he saw the same vast emptiness that surrounded him. The galaxy, his galaxy, was so far away that its stars were like dust. In the other directions the empty gulf was so wide that galaxies and clusters of galaxies were tiny, feeble specks of light shining across it. All around him was a void so huge that galaxies were only specks in it. Who could know what forces or dangers might be waiting out there? A light blinked, reminding him it was time to attend to his duties. The job required an hour, and he was nervous and not yet hungry when he had finished. He went to the exerciser springs on the wall and performed a workout that left him tired and sweating, but which at least gave him a small appetite. The day passed, and the next. He made another search of the bubble's interior with the same results as before. He felt almost sure, then, that there was nothing in the bubble with him. He established a routine of work, pastime and sleep, that made the first week pass fairly comfortably, but for the gnawing worry in his mind that something invisible was lurking just outside the windows. Then one day he accidentally kicked the wall with his metal shoe tip. It made a sound like that from kicking a tight-stretched section of tin, and it seemed to him it gave a little from the impact as tin would do. He realized for the first time how thin it was, how deadly, dangerously thin. According to the specifications he had read, it was only one-sixteenth of an inch thick. It was as thin as cardboard. He sat down with pencil and paper and began calculating. The bubble had a surface area of 146,500 square inches, and the internal air pressure was 14 pounds to the square inch, which meant that the thin metal skin contained a total pressure of 2,051,000 pounds. 2 million pounds. The bubble in which he sat was a bomb waiting to explode the instant any section of the thin metal weakened. It was supposed to be an alloy so extremely strong that it had a high safety factor, but he could not believe that any metal so thin could be so strong. It was all right for engineers sitting safely on the earth to speak of high safety factors, but his life depended upon the fragile wall not cracking. It made a lot of difference. The next day, he thought he felt the hook to which the exerciser spring was attached crack loose from where it was welded to the wall. He inspected the base of the hook closely, and there seemed to be a fine, hairline fracture appearing around it. He held his ear to it, listening for any sound of a leak. It was not leaking yet, but it could commence doing so at any time. He looked out the windows at the illimitable void that was waiting to absorb his pitiful little supply of air, and he thought of the days he had hauled and jerked at the springs with all his strength, not realizing the damage he was doing. There was a sick feeling in his stomach for the rest of the day, and he returned again and again to examine the hairline around the hook. The next day he discovered an even more serious threat. The thin skin of the bubble had been spot-welded to the outside reinforcing girders. Such welding often created hard, brittle spots that would soon crystallize from continued movement, and there was a slight temperature difference in the bubble between his working and sleeping hours that would daily produce a contraction and expansion of the skin. Especially when he used the little cooking burner. He quit using the burner for any purpose, 
and began a daily inspection of every square inch of the bubble's walls, marking with a white chalk all the welding spots that appeared to be definitely weakened. Each day he found more to mark, and soon the little white circles were scattered across the walls wherever he looked. When he was not working at examining the walls, he could feel the windows watching him, like staring eyes. Out of self-defense, he would have to go to them and stare back at the emptiness. Space was alien, coldly, deadly alien. He was a tiny spark of life in a hostile sea of nothing, and there was no one to help him. The nothing outside was waiting day and night for the most infinitesimal leak or crack in the walls. The nothing that had been waiting out there since time without beginning, and would wait for time without end. Sometimes he would touch his finger to the wall and think, Death is out there, only one-sixteenth of an inch away. His first fears became a black and terrible conviction. The bubble could not continue to resist the attack for long. It had already lasted longer than it should have. Two million pounds of pressure wanted out, and all that sucking nothing of intergalactic space wanted in. And only a thin skin of metal, rotten with brittle welding spots, stood between them. It wanted in. The nothing wanted in. He knew, then, that Horn and Silverman had not been insane. It wanted in, and some day it would get in. When it did, it would explode him and jerk out his guts and lungs. Not until that happened, not until the nothing filled the bubble and enclosed his hideous, turned-inside-out body would it ever be content. He had long since quit wearing the magnetized shoes, afraid the vibration of them would weaken the bubble still more, and he began noticing sections where the bubble did not seem to be perfectly concave, as though the rolling mill had pressed the metal too thin in places, and it was swelling out like an over-inflated balloon. He could not remember when he had last attended to the instruments. Nothing was important but the danger that surrounded him. He knew the danger was rapidly increasing, because whenever he pressed his ear to the wall, he could hear the almost inaudible tickings and vibrations as the bubble's skin contracted or expanded, and the nothing tapped and searched with its empty fingers for a flaw or crack that it could tear into a leak. But... The windows were far the worst, with nothing staring in at him day and night. There was no escape from it. He could feel it watching him, malignant and gloating, even when he hid his eyes in his hands. The time came when he could stand it no longer. The cot had a blanket, and he used that together with all his spare clothes to make a tent stretching from the table to the first instrument panel. When he crawled under it, he found that the lower half of one window could still see him. He used the clothes he was wearing to finish the job, and it was much better then, hiding there in the concealing darkness where the nothing could not see him. He did not mind going naked. The temperature regulators in the bubble never let it get too cold. He had no conception of time from then on. He emerged only when necessary to bring more food into his tent. He could still hear the nothing tapping and sucking in its ceaseless search for a flaw, and he made such emergences as brief as possible, wishing that he did not have to come out at all. Maybe, if he could hide in his tent for a long time and never make a sound, it would get tired and go away. Sometimes he thought of the cruiser and wished they would come for him, but most of the time he thought of the thing that was outside, trying to get in to kill him. When the strain became too great, he would draw himself up in the position he had once occupied in his mother's womb, and pretend he had never left earth. It was easier there. 
but always, before very long, the bubble would tick or whisper, and he would freeze in terror, thinking, this time it's coming in. Then one day, suddenly, two men were peering under his tent at him. One of them said, My God! Again! And he wondered what he meant. But they were very nice to him, and helped him put on his clothes. Later in the cruiser, everything was hazy, and they kept asking him what he was afraid of. What was it? What did you find? He tried hard to think so he could explain it. It was... it was... nothing. What were you and Horn and Silverman afraid of? What was it? the voice demanded insistently. I told you, he said. Nothing. They stared at him, and the haziness cleared a little as he saw they did not understand. He wanted them to believe him, because what he told them was so very true. It wanted to kill us. Please, can't you believe me? It was waiting outside the bubble to kill us. But they kept staring, and he knew they didn't believe him. They didn't want to believe him. Everything turned hazy again, and he started to cry. He was glad when the doctor took his hand to lead him away. The bubble was carefully inspected, inside and out, and nothing was found. When it was time for Green's replacement to be transferred to it, Larkin reported to Captain McDowell. "'Everything is ready, Larkin,' McDowell said. "'You're the next one. I wish we knew what the danger is.' He scowled. "'I still think one of my roustabouts from the engine room might give us a sane report six months from now, instead of the babblings we'll get from you.' He felt his face flush and he said stiffly, "'I suggest, sir, that you not jump to conclusions until that time comes.' The cruiser vanished back into hyperspace, and he was alone inside the observation bubble, ten thousand light-years beyond the galaxy's outermost sun. He looked out the windows at the gigantic sea of emptiness around him, and wondered again what the danger had been that had so terrified the men before him. Of one thing he was already certain. He would find that nothing was waiting outside the bubble to kill him. The End of The Nothing Equation by Tom Godwin The author for that story was Tom Goodwin. He was an American science fiction author. Goodwin published three novels and 27 short stories. His hard science fiction story, The Cold Equations, is probably his best-known work and was adapted to radio for Dimension X in the 50s. He's also known to have written for The Twilight Zone. These are your stories, sent by you, for you. First story was posted using the submission page at ronsamazingstories.com. Michael from Cleveland, Ohio, sent in this story he calls The Moonville Tunnel. Hello, Ron. Your podcast is the best. I love the new format and look forward to the stories each week. It dawned on me that I probably shouldn't just listen. I need to send one in as well. If everyone just listened, I'll guess that you wouldn't have any stories to tell. Here's mine, but with a bit of history first. The darkest, most desolate stretch of the Merida and Cincinnati Railroad ran through Moonville, Ohio. According to local legend, an epidemic once spread through the tiny community, and trains were forbidden from stopping there. Running low on supplies, residents sent a volunteer with a lantern to flag down a cargo train on the edge of town. 
The idea was that the train's conductor would start to slow down after seeing the man outside of town and would come to a stop by the time he cleared the passage. But the plan never had a chance. The volunteer was late getting to the tunnel, and the oncoming train struck and killed him before he could reach the other side. Today, the Moonville Tunnel is one of the few remaining landmarks of the defunct mining town, and some visitors still claim to see a ghostly figure carrying a lantern in the darkness. That's the history, and this is my story. Let me start by saying I'm not a ghost hunter. However, I've been known to go to haunted places just to see if anything will ever happen to me. Nothing ever does, and for the most part, left me as a skeptic until a day in June when I was turned from skeptic to believer. The Moonville Tunnel today is a favorited hiking stop. My wife and I made plans to hike a section of the 10-mile trail, but to do it towards evening in hopes of seeing something. We got to the tunnel, hung around for a picnic, and waited to see what would happen. For the most part, it was trouble-free and quite fun. We enjoyed the rich history provided by markers on the trail itself, and our picnic was pleasant. I will admit that we had brought some forms of entertainment that was, shall we say, not entirely legal. However, for my wife, it's a medical necessity. We were enjoying that near the bridge that leads to the tunnel when it all happened. We both saw a figure moving towards the entrance. It was mostly mist, but there was a bright light about where its arms were. It moved towards the center of the tunnel and then rapidly moved inside. We dropped what we were doing and ran after it. About halfway down the tunnel, it stopped, reversed direction, then shot right by us very fast and was gone. That's it. Everyone we tell this story to says it was the weed. Anyone who smokes knows the mild stuff does not produce anything but a pleasant buzz. We saw what we saw, and we stand behind it. There was no one else around, and we never even thought to record it on a cell phone. I leave it to decide what you will, but I can say I am now a believer. Michael well, Michael, I'm a pretty good judge of story, and this one rings true to me. While I'm not a weed user, it is legal here in Washington, and I've researched it enough to know that there are many different types of highs, and not all of them cause hallucinations. Thank you for sharing your story, and you're right when you say, if people don't send in their tales, there wouldn't be any for me to read. Thank you again, Michael. Our second story is something right out of the newspapers. It was sent in by Jim from New Mexico and is titled, Don't Listen to This One, In the Dark. There was an old-time radio show called Lights Out. At the start of it, a spectral voice urged listeners to darken their room in anticipation of the story that would follow. For this story... I'm saying, lights on. What I'm about to tell you includes an unusual mix of deeply scary stuff. A family is snowbound through a frigid night almost two miles above sea level. Nearby is a secret government installation, a mysterious treatment center for pedophile priests, and even closer by, a grisly murder is committed on the slopes of that very same mountain. Add to it all a sudden power surge raging through a car's electrical system. Actually, I'm not about to forget any of it, because it all happened to me, and every detail of this story is true. Are those lights on? My story begins with excitement. My wife and I and our two sons were leaving the dealership where we had just purchased a brand new 1997 SUV. We live in New Mexico, the land of enchantment, but also the land of surprisingly few paved, or even, graveled roads. The state is packed with wonders, but to encounter the best, you simply must get off the highways and onto the dirt. 
Now, with a four-wheel drive vehicle, this incredible state lay open before us. We instantly gave the new addition to our family a name, Big Blue, and headed out to see what it could do. The Hemis Mountains beckoned to our northwest horizon. There is a paved road through the range, its state highway, number four, which climbs through the valleys working its way up a 9,000-foot pass, where it then slips down into Los Alamos, the secret city where the atomic bomb was invented during World War II. Today, the facilities at Los Alamos are scattered all over the Hemis, where all sorts of experimental work is done. Some say the things done there would tax the skills of the most imaginative science fiction writers. But State Highway No. 4 wasn't in our plans. We followed it for a while, but just outside the village of Hemis Springs, we veered onto a gravel road that left the valley to push even higher into the mountains. Several miles later, we saw a forest road that looked like it headed into the true wilderness. That was the road for us. It was late March, a time of warm days and cold nights in the Rio Grande Valley where we lived. But in the high mountains, March was still winter. Our road was clear, but there was some pretty big snowdrift under the trees, and we were pressing even higher. We reached a place where a small tree had fallen across our route. Common sense would have told us to turn back, but after all, we were driving Big Blue, so we moved it and continued on. We soon came up to another barrier, but we pushed that one aside too. All the time, we were rising higher and higher above the Hemis Valley, and Highway 4 was now far below us. We were inviting disaster, and it accepted the invitation. We came over the top of a little ridge a bit fast and landed square on top of a snowbank, front and back wheels spinning in empty air. No one was injured, but we were hung up and it was obvious Big Blue wasn't going anywhere. As often happens in March, the snowbank had thawed and frozen many times and now was nothing but solid ice. In our Lewis and Clark enthusiasm for adventure, we failed to notice something that real explorers wouldn't have missed. It was getting dark. As I said, in the valley, March nights meant freezing temperatures. At our altitude, survival was an immediate issue. We quickly gave up on trying to dig out, and seeing that it was too late to try walking out, we all piled into Big Blue, bundled up for sleep, and agreed to use the heater only when we couldn't stand the creeping advance of the cold. I remember waking up with a feeling of foreboding. The dashboard clock displayed 12.10 a.m., and everyone else seemed to be asleep. The engine was turned off, and the chill was deep. Suddenly, the whole vehicle came alive. All the electrical door locks started locking and unlocking themselves in sequence that surged around the SUV from door to door at an impossible speed. The racket sounded like someone was pouring gravel onto the roof. The electrical surge lasted at least two deafening minutes. When it finally ended, we were all awake, but no one said a single word. There wasn't much sleeping the rest of that night. When the sky finally started to brighten, my oldest son and I walked out, and after about five miles, met some people who had come into the high country to ride their horses. They immediately unhitched their trailers, and we all drove up to Big Blue. Our new friends used a winch and dragged us off the ice. Our vehicle suffered little damage, was still drivable, and so, after the appropriate thanks, we went home. In the warm comfort of our home, we finally talked about what happened. I thought we may have all found ourselves in the path of some sort of power beam being tested by the Los Alamos labs at a facility somewhere near the SUV. Nobody really believed that, but no one had a better explanation until the local evening news came on. It was well known throughout New Mexico that there was a facility called Servants of the Paraclete, located in Hemes Springs. 
Catholic bishops all over would send priests who had been accused of assaulting children to that facility for a time of prayer and reflection. Then they were sent back to the various parishes, sometimes with tragic results. On the same night we were snowbound, one of these priests had walked up Highway 4 to a place directly below us. Apparently he was going to meet a relative of someone who he had assaulted. At the meeting, the priest was attacked and brutally murdered. His body was scattered in pieces all over the roadway. When did the news report the time of the murder? It was shortly after midnight, the same time as our strange electrical surge. Hearing that report, I wondered out loud if such a murder could trigger a cacophonous power surge through a turned-off vehicle two miles away. Today, I'm pretty sure it did, but I have no idea how. <laughs> wow, Jim, that was another great story from you, and this time, you took it up a notch. I did a bit of research looking for an explanation for the door lock thingy. I did find that there is a rare condition in some cars that caused the main actuator to randomly fire. This is a repeated behavior and is easy to repair by replacing the faulty actuator. I somehow don't think that this explains what happened to you. Thank you for the incredible story. It was amazing. Johnny, is this true? Okay, I like to surf the internet looking for stories and other oddities. I do this in the name of the podcast, but the truth is, it's fun to see what's out there. What you're about to hear is what I call... Johnny, is this true? I will tell you a story and then ask the question, did I make it up or is it true? Let's get started. Story 1 Decades ago, when the owner of the now Skirvin Hilton Hotel in Oklahoma City discovered that he had impregnated one of his housekeepers. He responded by locking the maid in one of the hotel rooms. She was to stay there even after she had the baby. However, the despairing housekeeper had other plans and threw herself and the baby out the window. Now, did I have a moment of insanity, or is this a real story? If you said true, you are, unfortunately, correct. How grisly. Nowadays, her spirit tends to get a lot of press for terrorizing NBA players. Opponents of the Oklahoma City Thunder typically stay at the century-old hotel, and athletes have reported hearing a baby cry in their rooms and knocks at their doors. They've also seen drawers open and doors close without reason. The New York Knicks once blamed a loss on a restless night caused by the prank-playing spirit. Story 2 Marion Ross of the sitcom Happy Days claims that a ghost haunted the Paramount studio set where the show was mostly filmed. She said it was a prankster of sort and would move things around the various trailers. Once, when she was resting between scenes, there was a knock on her trailer. She went to the door to find no one there. Sitting on the step was a set of keys. She picked them up and brought them inside. Later that day, Henry Winkler was asking around if anyone had seen his keys. He could not only not get into his trailer, but he wanted to go home. Mary took him to her trailer and asked if these were his, and they were. Henry said that he was sure that he had left them in his trailer. Now, is that studio legend, or did I make it up? Well, if you said fake news, you got it. I didn't even research this one, except to find out where they recorded the show. 
Story 3 Gary C. from Buckystown, Maryland, sent in our next story. John Morgan and Ashley Dubow were arrested in September in connection with a robbery in Asheville, Ohio. The bank was robbed on August 24th when a man wearing a hoodie demanded cash from the teller. Just a few days later, Morgan and Dubow began posting a series of photographs on Facebook featuring Morgan posing with wads of cash. Well, that sounds pretty good. Or did Gary make it up? This is a very true story, and it goes without saying the guy was an idiot. Morgan is the convicted felon who was just released from prison after serving five years for robbing a bank in Lancaster, a city 20 miles east of Ashenville. Morgan and Dubow were taken to the Pickway County Jail in lieu of a $250,000 bond. You can see a slideshow of the incriminating images at smokinggun.com. Story 4 our last story for this edition of Johnny, Is It True? comes from the great state of Oregon. A vehicle was completely flattened between two semis, and the driver is fine. Despite his Chevy Silverado being crushed to the size of a small go-kart, Caleb Whitby only received a few cuts and bruises in the January I-84 accident near Baker City, Oregon. This can't be true. I must have concocted this one for sure. Nope, this totally happened and is an amazing story. Black ice conditions led to multiple accidents that day. In Whitby's crash, a tractor-trailer jackknife across the highway. Whitby slid into the truck. Another tractor-trailer saw the first truck and slid sideways, crushing Whitby's pickup. After ascertaining that Whitby was alive and not seriously injured, the second truck driver asked if he could take a picture. So, there's even proof of this miracle, which I will have linked in the show notes. More than 100 people were involved in the pileup, involving 20 vehicles, most of them semis. How about that? Do you have any strange but true stories you want to share? If you do, send them to ronsamazingstories at gmail.com and I'll use them if I can. Wow, so many stories this week. I want to thank our contributors to this podcast. Kenny, Michael, Jim, and Gary, you guys are the best. Next week, we will have a replay to celebrate Memorial Day. I will be sure to pick a good one. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, it's easy to do. Just head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you'll find all of the links you could possibly need. We are on Twitter. Facebook, iTunes, TuneIn, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and many other services. Pick one and do leave some feedback about the show. It really does help us to grow. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.